hello, everybody. I, uh, as Alex said, I have been, well, I started at West Texas A&M in 1997, I have to think back, about 27 years ago, and I've taught a lot. And uh, what I would usually do when I see a turnout like this in class is I would give a quiz to reward those that were here. And so I'm not going to do that. The other thing I would do is I would play Simon Says to try to keep everybody awake. So the good news is I only got, I only got 20 uh, minutes to talk with you today. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, just a very simple spreadsheet tool that, that we've been working on that's a learning tool. But in order to set that up, I need to talk a little bit about drought and declining groundwater. And this might be a little bit of a repeat from what you've heard from some of the other speakers, but uh, um, just as important non nonetheless. Um, the photo there is my, my three-year-old grandson who wanted to, he told me he wanted to water the truck. Uh, really what he wanted, he wanted to wash the truck. Uh, but it makes me think and you guys have kids and grandkids that uh, what they're going to see 20, 25, 30 years from now is going to be way different than what we see right now. Th things are changing, and that's one thing I'll be talking about, just, just change. Um, one thing that we have here that makes it really hard for farming is our highly variable precipitation. It's dry one year wet the next. I heard a previous speaker saying it was you know, 80, 80 degrees a couple days ago and 25 today. And if you don't like the weather, just wait a little bit because it's going to change. I, people tell me that all the time when I gripe about it. Um, talk a little bit about our, our dropping groundwater levels and then decreasing well capacity. We, um, we peaked in about 1999-2000 with how much water we were pumping out of the ground. And, and it's slowly been going down since then. In the northern panhandle, we've seen about a 25% decrease in ability to pump in the last 25 years. They're predicting about the same in the next 25. And then in the, in the southern counties, they're predicting a 58% decrease in the next 25 years. And when I talk with the guys down in the southern counties, they say, well, that's not possible because we don't have anything already. How can you have 58% less when you don't have anything to start with? And that's kind of that's kind of what, what we're dealing with. I also tell, tell my farmers in the north that if you want to see your future, look and see what it looks like between Emerald and Lubbock. And they don't like to hear that, but that's... That is the future of the north. Just look to the south. Wherever I go, if, whichever county I go to, I usually start by showing them a aerial photograph. This is just off of Google, Google Maps. But this is from the north up near Dalhart. And it's pretty obvious there's still some water up there. There's still some center pivots that are getting fully irrigated. There are also a lot of pivots that are, you're seeing split because they just don't have enough water to irrigate that, that full center pivot. If you look south, this is, this is uh, near Dimmit, and you move from Dimmit on further south to, to Lubbock, you see more and more of this, where you see not even half a pivot or a third of pivot, but even less than that being irrigated, because there's just no groundwater available. This is not news to you. I don't think. If it is, good luck farming. Most of you guys that are farming and have been around here know that this is how it is. And we're going to have to deal with it. And we're hardy people. We will deal with it. When I give my presentations, this is the probably the one that most people look at it and, and they, they grab their phones and they take a picture. This is, this is, a bar chart of what I call growing season precipitation. So this is June, July, and August, three months of precipitation for the last 130 years. The average, this is in Randall County, the average has been about eight, eight and a half inches. 
but the point here is not what the average is, but how much variation we have around that average. And you look and it's all over the place. It ranges from about two inches to 16 inches. If we knew we were gonna get average precipitation every year, life would be wonderful, wouldn't it? You guys that farm, if you knew you were gonna get eight and a half inches of rain, during this period, and you could count on it year after year, life would be wonderful, but we don't know. We've got a lot of people trying to predict what's gonna happen, but it's hard. It's hard predicting the weather around here. You hear a lot about climate change and global warming and people pointing fingers ever which way. Um, I went ahead and did a regression. Some of you guys in statistics know what a regression is, but it's a trend line. It's a trend line of our precipitation, and there is, in Randall County anyway, there is a downward trend in the last 130 years in precipitation in our, in our growing season. Not very much, but my argument is that our short-term year-to-year variability still greatly exceeds any long-term trend. We can't blame the difficulty in farming here on long-term trends. We can blame the difficulty in farming here on high variability in rainfall and the fact that we just don't get enough. Now I grew up, I grew up west of here in New Mexico where 18 inch annual rainfall sounded pretty good where I grew up was 13 to 14 inches of rainfall. And so no matter how bad we got it, there's always somebody that's got it worse. I like to show this too. This is a, this is a little bit better argument for climate change, at least in the last 130 years. But we have seen an increase. If you look at the trend line, we have seen an increase in average temperature during the growing season by about 2.4 degrees. Again, I'm not going to talk politics and try to blame. You get enough of that watching the news. Everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else. And um, one thing I will tell you is I have studied a lot of climate change and read a lot of books, not just studying the last 130 years, but studying the last thousands of years. And there's evidence that we used to have ice where we didn't have ice. There's evidence that it used to be a lot warmer than it did. And so that's just one thing that, that, that's part of our climate is it changes. And what the bigger question is what are we going to do about it? Now that circle on the left, most of you guys that were around here in 2011, you remember 2011. Who's, who, who could, if you're a farmer especially, who can forget 2011? It was hot, it was dry, we had fires like we're having fires right now. And in Randall County, we got about two inches of rain during that three month period. I would argue that two inches is essentially the same as zero because it was small quarter inch rain and it evaporated the next day. It just wasn't any use. But what I wanna point out on this, everybody made a big deal about pointing fingers and saying it's climate change and it's, it's cattle and it's, it's, pet it's petroleum and all this stuff and that's what caused 2011. But I would rather look at the history and if you look back, 2011 is not an anomaly. If you look at this graph, there are multiple other times when we had drought. That's one thing that we have here. We have drought and it seems like every year we say we're in a drought. We do. And I do, every year. It's just part of where we live. But if you look back, there is evidence of other years, many other years when we have had poor growing season precipitation. You guys have heard the Dust Bowl, the Dirty 30s? Randall County, we had three bad years. Most other places in the, and most other counties in Texas Panda was four, four out of six years that were bad. Comparable, semi-comparable to 2011. And so looking at this map, 
looking at this graph, I would ask you, is it possible, is it probable that we're going to have bad weather conditions again? This year doesn't look too good, does it? So this is my message to farmers is look back, and, and the older farmers know. The, the older farmers been around long enough. I work with a, a crop consultant who's about 80 years old, and his wisest words to me and to those that he works with, those farmers, he says, plan for drought, and when you get it, you won't be surprised. Plan for it. And this graph kind of summarizes it. Now, you'll notice that yellow box there on the top says Dust Bowl in 1930s. I've got another yellow box that marked what I call the early Dust Bowl because it doesn't even have a name, and most people don't even know about it. But we have evidence of another period of several years of drought before we even started measuring rainfall. Let me read something to you. This is... This excerpt came out of a, a dissertation, and, and it was one of the most interesting. Normally, I don't like reading dis dissertations. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. But, but this one is good. It's a history dissertation. It's by Donald Green. It was written in 1969. It's available on the web for free, or you can buy his book that he published a few years later, but I'm all about free. And actually, I think his, his dissertation reads a lot better than the book. But it's called the Irrigation Frontier on the Texas High Plains. It's a history of water development in the Panhandle between 1910 and 1960. And if you like reading about history like I do, go, go read it. It's fun to read. It's also astonishing to read because back when we started drilling wells in 1910 and 1910s, the 1920s, what did we think about our groundwater, our ancestors? They said, it will never run out. There is so much water. It's being recharged from Colorado, and it's just wonderful. And they had wells that were pumping 1,000 gallons per minute. And so what did they do? They pumped the heck out of it, and they drilled more wells. And then in the 50s, we discovered how to how to design and build center pivots, and we could farm more and more and more and pump more and more, and technology got us to a point where we're at now. And we argue that technology is going to get us out of this, and, and I disagree sometimes. I, I don't think technology is going to get us out of this. It's going to take something a lot more hardier than technology to get us out of this this declining groundwater thing. We're just going to have to change. There's no doubt. But let me read this to you. This is out of the newspaper in Tascosa. Does anybody know where Tascosa is? Bo uh, Boys Ranch. So right, if you go north of Vega on your way to Dalhart and you cro cross the Canadian River right there, that is Boys Ranch and that's Tascosa. So this, this excerpt came out of the newspaper in Tascosa says it was the hardest windstorm the oldest inhabitant knows anything of. It just naturally blew and blew and blew, blowed and blowed and blowed, swept the country all up in one great big continuous sweep. It piled dust heaps everywhere and sent dust through and into the tightest buildings and rattled the roofs and shook the fences and scattered the loose boards and boxes and barrels and bent the trees and roared and howled and shrieked and hissed till nothing else could be heard. It was frightful. That's a long sentence, isn't it? But it got the point across. It was bad during those few periods. And this, this time period, I've been calling it early dust ball. It doesn't really have a name because most people don't even know about it. But if you know about it and you know how bad the dust ball is and you, you look back and say there was not just one dust ball but there was two dust bowls, and I don't like saying this, but we could have another. And if we do, are we prepared? 
And that's what I talk to farmers. Are you prepared? If you're planning for a drought, then you're not going to be, you're not going to be shocked when you have it. If you're planning for average rainfall and you get, if you're planning on an eight, eight inch rainfall and you get two inches, you're in trouble. Remember 2011, and most of them that were farming remember that. I'm going to switch gears to actually what I wanted to talk about. Um, we'll just, just take a few more minutes, but I, I've been working on a tool. It's just an educational tool, and it's really a pretty simple Excel spreadsheet. And if you look at this and you say, I'd like to have a copy of that, send me an email, and I'll send it to you. It's free. You get what you pay for. It's just a tool. You know what they say about models? All models are wrong, some are useful. And I hope that you find this one useful. I know a lot of farmers look at it and they go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. If you look at what we know going into growing season, we know how big a field, we, know, we should know how much our irrigation capacity is, how much soil moisture we have. We pretty much know what the markets are gonna be when we sell our crop and we know how much our inputs are with our expenses. What we don't know is growing season precipitation amount and timing and temperature. And so I developed this little spreadsheet. Normally when I have time I actually demonstrate the spreadsheet. I'm just going to show you a few what ifs. But if we had 700 GPM, which most farmers don't anymore, 700 GPM growing corn irrigated corn, and these numbers are based on economics from not this year, but last year when things were better. Um, but if you had 700 GPM corn, what this says is that on the right, that graph on the right is what would we do if we planted that whole, that whole center pivot, that whole 120 acres in corn, and the one in the left is an optimization of corn and fallow. So basically this says if we got that much water and you get eight and a half inches of growing season precipitation and you've got eight inches of water in your soil profile, you can count on 285 bushel corn, which is good and you, you can do that if you got lots of water. But then I ask the question, what happens if 2011 comes along? Well, if you've got 700 GPM, drought doesn't matter that much. Our yield went down to 226 on the right, 226 bushels per acre, but most farmers would still be pretty happy with that. Now, if you wanted to optimize, if you wanted to plan for 2011, instead of growing 120 acres, you would grow 100 acres and put 20 in fallow. And if you look at the profit, you would actually make more profit by farming less. And I know that's, that's not intuitive, but it is, I'm, this is what I'm trying to, you know, get into people's heads. Make it intuitive. Make it where you think, need to start thinking different as you have less and less water. Let's say instead of 700 GPM, we've got 420 GPM, and I know I'm, out, I'm trying to rush this, Alex. Okay, um, we got 420 GPM. 420 GPM average rainfall over there on the right, 240 bushels per acre. And that is about average for the Texas Panhandle. Now, if we wanted to optimize with that 420 GPM, we actually could make just a little bit more money by farming 90 acres instead of 30 acres, put 30 acres in fallow. Drought year comes along, we had that whole 120 acres in corn, and the yield turns out to be 129. And actually what happened in, in 2011, because it was warmer than normal, most farmers didn't even have enough corn to harvest. They just cut it for silage, chopped it. But do you, are you starting to see the picture? Plan for drought with 420 GPM, just, just plant half that pivot. 
Now, this, this spreadsheet is designed so that, because this is what I get this all the time. Farmers say, well, I can't get 285, never have. Put your own numbers in. You know, I, it doesn't cost me that much. Put your own numbers in. That's what it's for. It's an exercise. Down to 200 GPM. Average year, 163 bushels on the right. Drought year, 52 bushels. Not even going to harvest that. This is just fun to play with. And so if you, wa if you want to play with it, just, just send me an email. I'll send it to you. Just start punk punching numbers in there. It's fun. It really is. If you don't like the numbers, put your own numbers in. That's what the yellow is. The yellow is, is numbers where you put in your, your farm-specific numbers, your field-specific numbers. I've also got one for forage sorghum. Actually, I've got a lot of these spreadsheets. That was just, a lot of these are just for training. I've got corn and, and, and fallow. I've got uh, forage sorghum and fallow. I've got corn and dry land cotton, and we're working on some others too. And so, um, anyway, I think I'm going to, I'll show you this one for forage sorghum. There's one, uh, 200 GPM for drought, where we would actually only farm 40 out of 120 acres. There's my email if you want a copy of this, if you think it might be useful. If you want to take it and improve on it, all you guys in college back there, take this as a, as a template and improve it and sell it and make a lot of money. And send me half. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Uh, if if, uh, if you got any questions, I know we're running short of time, but I'll be back in the back. And uh, uh, anyway, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. And, and uh, I hope that this year isn't 2011. I do. It's not looking too good. Thank you.